Merry Christmas to you. Happy birthday, Jesus. Whatever you want to say, guys, it's, it's all right with me. But guys, this is uh, such a good day for us to be together because today we're, we're here to celebrate the coming of our great God, Savior, and King, Jesus Christ, okay? And so if you're new, again, I want to I wanna welcome you. Again, my name is Rob, one of the pastors here. Guys, it's honestly a, a great honor. My heart's just filled with joy to be gathered with you today. One of the highest honors of my life, one of the, my favorite things that I get to do is to open up the Bible and teach every time that we gather like that. And that's especially true um, today as we celebrate Christmas. But guys, I don't, I don't know about you, but I, I absolutely love this time of year. Okay, and it's not so much the lack of sunlight and the seasonal depression that I'm currently experiencing right now. Treating, but I, I used to think that that wasn't real. This year, I don't know if it's because I'm getting older. It's real, okay? But not so much that. Because I love this time of year because I love Jesus Christ. And this is what Christmas is all about. That when we speak about Christmas, guys, we're really speaking of the worship of Christ. That the word Christmas comes from two ancient words, Christ and Mass. So of course, like Christ, Jesus Christ, and then mass is really just an old word that the church would use uh, to describe their worship services that were all devoted to Jesus. And so Christmas is literally, in its own title, the worship of Christ. And so for us as a, as a church family, the way that we worship Christ together is we, we gather together, we open the Bible together, we, we pray together, we sing songs together, and everything is, is centered on and revolves around and is devoted to Jesus. And so the reason that we are worshiping Jesus is because he alone is worthy, amen? That even when we talk about worship, that word literally means to ascribe value or worth to something. And so what we're doing here today is ultimately we are remembering and honoring and praising and glorifying and adoring and celebrating the person and the work of Jesus Christ who alone is worthy. And this is really the big idea today. Guys, I want you to know this, that Jesus is worthy of your worship. He is absolutely worthy of your worship. And if you're a Christian today, all right, I want to just do this. I want to remind you of the goodness and the greatness of Jesus. And as you're reminded of Jesus and his words, his works, and his ways, that you would come to a place of just having your worship and your joy elevated as you leave this place. That you would leave here like the Magi in the Christmas story that we're so familiar with that rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That you would leave this place remembering who Jesus is, what he has done, abounding in joy. That's my goal for you. And if you're here and you're not yet a Christian, all right, but you're just here because it's that time of year or your girl just said, hey, you're coming with me or mom or whatever, right? I wanna know, I, I, I'm grateful that you're here. It's, it's truly an honor to have you gathered with us, but here is my goal for you today. I was in that same seat of just kind of like, whatever, for 24 years of my life. Here's my goal for you. I simply wanna help you to see the real Jesus. I want you to see who Jesus really is. Not the Jesus that maybe you've heard some like terrible Christians talk about. Not the Jesus that maybe you've experienced in, in broken churches, but the Jesus who reveals himself to the page, is through the pages of the Bible to us. Because here's what I, I think is true, and here's what I found to be true in my life. That guys, when you see Jesus for who he actually is, and you see Jesus and what he has actually done for you, and you see Jesus and how much he loves you, and you see Jesus and what he is saying to you, because it leads to worship. And it helps us to realize that Jesus is, in fact, worthy of our worship. And so if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to grab it and find your way to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. All right, if you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it. It's going to be up here on the screen. But guys, hey, this is what we do as a church. Every family has its thing, right? Our, our thing as the Doxa family is every time we gather like that, we, we, like we are right now, we gather around the Bible, that we believe that this is actually a book that God wrote. And in it, God is speaking to us about himself, about ourselves, about our great need for him, about the world around us. And so as we gather like this every single Sunday and in connection groups, small groups throughout the week, we open up the Bible and we come eager and expectant that God is gonna speak to us And by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, we seek to respond to God, thereby becoming the men and women that God has created us to be. And so if you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you the gift of a Bible this Christmas. 
All right, so on your way out, at the end of the coffee bar at Info Corner, you can grab one for yourself or a couple for your family, and that would just be a great way for us to bless you this Christmas with the gift of God's Word. And so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. All right, the very first Christmas, we're going to look at the historical events surrounding the first Christmas. All right, you guys ready? All right, I'm going to do it anyway. But this is Christmas, guys. I'm wearing a tie for crying out loud. Let's go, okay? <laughs> chapter 1. Verse, I had to mention the tie because I, you don't need to email me and be like you looked weird. I, if you're new, I always wear jean jackets and short sleeve shirts, okay? So tie today, chapter 1 of Matthew's Gospel, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Jesus. Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Now, this is the simple historical account of the very first Christmas. And as we look on this, guys, what we see is that it's really all about Jesus Christ. And if you're newer to the Bible, you're newer to church, you're newer to Christianity, there is so much that we can learn from even just the name Jesus Christ. All right, Jesus literally means that God is our Savior. All right, that He is our Savior. That if you're wondering why, like, we're so excited and we're, we're here and we got donuts, I'm wearing a tie, we got a choir, all this stuff, but you're wondering why people have their hands in the air and they're singing and everybody seems to be joyful, this is why. We have a Savior in Jesus, Amen. And in his name alone, we learn about his identity and his activity of coming to earth on this Christmas. And my goal, guys, is for us, as we open up the Bible together and see Jesus, that we would understand the salvation that Jesus brings, but not that we would just understand it, but that, hear this, that you would experience this today. So his name is Jesus, but it's not just Jesus, but it's Christ. And Christ is not his last name, believe it or not. Christ is actually his title. That Christ literally means the anointed one, the chosen one, the special one. And so Jesus Christ, he is chosen, he is unique, he is special. All right, that Jesus doesn't fit on kind of like the proverbial Mount Rushmore of other good people who have lived throughout the history of the world. And so it's not like you line up and you have like the Dalai Lama and Oprah and, and the Pope and then you got Jesus over here. Jesus is in a category unto himself. He's not just a good man, but he's the God man, and we're going to talk about that today. But this is what Christmas is all about. And chances are, if you've, if you've ever been to church on a Christmas Eve service or a Christmas Day service, you've heard what we just read, that first Christmas narrative, that I, it's, it's very familiar to many of us. And as we hear that, guys, to my best estimation, as we just read that first Christmas account, I think there's three groups of people represented in this room. There's, there's those of you who are disciples, that you're just excited. It doesn't even matter what I say, right? You're just gonna, you're here, you love Jesus, you're gonna be singing, you're gonna be excited, you're gonna be worshiping, regardless if I just threw up and passed out and sat down, right? You don't care, it's not about me, it's all about Jesus, and you're excited to be here. Amen? I know that there's others of you that It's not so much like a disciple and being excited, but some of you are just, you're familiar. You you, you know, you've been around. You're, You're familiar with the Bible. You're familiar with church. You're familiar with Jesus. You're familiar with Christmas. You're familiar with the songs. And that familiarity has just caused you to be a little bit numb. That maybe there's not like an excitement, there's not like an explosion of joy as you woke up and you're like, oh my gosh, we're about to celebrate Jesus, this is going to be great, right? But you're just like, oh yeah, we got to go do that thing today. And you're just kind of numb. 
to the reality of, of who Jesus is, what he has said, and what he has done. And then there's a third group that maybe you're just like dismissive. That you're here and maybe just kind of apathetic. That you're here and you don't really care. You're like, I'm not too concerned about what this guy's saying, about this whole thing. I'm just here because I gotta be here. If that's you, I love that, guys, it was not that long ago that I was sitting there feeling that exact same thing. But you're just apathetic. You're like, I I don't wanna respond. I don't wanna hear. I don't necessarily even wanna learn. With that in mind, those three groups of people, here's what I want to do today. I don't want to just stand up here and give you my thoughts and my words about Jesus. Okay? That there have been so many thoughts and words given about Jesus that flood our world today. I mean, if you just step back and think about it, more books and more songs have been written regarding Jesus than anyone who has ever lived throughout the history of the world. And so I could stand up here for hours and I can give you my thoughts and my words about Jesus and Christmas and I could quote to you men and women throughout history and give you their thoughts and their words concerning Jesus. But guys, I'm not going to do that today. Instead, here's what I want to do. I simply want to just share with you what Jesus said about himself, concerning himself. Because right, I, don't, I don't know if you know this or not. But when we look at the four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all right, these are historical accounts that are all about the birth, the life, the ministry, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. When we look at those four Gospels, right around 50% of the 82,000 words that make up that Gospel, those Gospels, all right, right around 50% were words spoken by Jesus. You know that? 50% of of all that we have in the Gospels, these are words that are spoken by Jesus, where Jesus tells us who he is and what he is actually all about. And guys, this is what we're actually going to get into today. And so if you do the math, that's right around 41,000 words that we're going to look at today. And this is why we did morning services, so you guys didn't have to be stressed out as I go a couple hours about your Christmas ham that's burning, right? Do you guys do the Christmas ham thing? No, good. That's great. Okay, but we're not going to do look at 40,000 words. But what we are going to do, guys, is we're going to look at six things that Jesus said about himself. Because the reality is, is we gather here on Christmas, and if you're familiar with the Christmas story, you know that we gather around and we're celebrating the birth of a baby. But what you need to understand is that baby grew to be a man, and that man said some wild things. And so we're going to look at six things that Jesus said about himself. And as we look at this, all right, my prayer is that you would realize who Jesus in fact is and that he is actually worthy of your worship, okay? So the first thing is this. Jesus said he came down from heaven. All right? And this is in John chapter 6, verse 38. Take a look. I have come down from heaven. All right, this is Jesus speaking. I've come down from heaven. They said that those who were listening to Jesus, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know, How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Okay, so in this moment, Jesus is telling us, and these people that are listening to him, that he existed before his entrance into human history from the womb of his mother, Mary. All right, he's telling us that he existed in eternity past in heaven as God, without beginning or end. And those who were present in this time, hearing this crazy claim from Jesus, they're just shocked. Because they're they're sitting there thinking like, hey, isn't this Joseph's boy? Like, isn't this the kid we used to pick on? Right, didn't we grow up with this guy? Didn't we watch him kind of grow from like a little kid into an adult? These people were asking like, how in the world can this man claim to have come down from heaven when we know him? We know him. Here's what you need to know. All right, these people knew Jesus, but they didn't fully understand Jesus. Some of you in here, you're you're very familiar with Jesus. But you don't really understand him. See, Jesus is God from heaven. He's God who came into human history on a rescue mission for us. And it's so important, this is so important for us to remember that Jesus is not a man who became God. All right, as these people were thinking. All right, there's, there's false religions and cults that even exist around us in this city that will teach you that Jesus was just a man who eventually worked his way up to become God. It's not that. It's that Jesus is God from heaven. 
And the truth is around Christmas is that God became one of us. Do you guys remember that song, What If God Was One of Us? Remember if you remember Austin Powers, you know, Dr. Evil, would be like, what if God was one? Right? I remember right after I became a Christian, I was listening to that, I was like, he was. <laughs> Jesus. This is Christmas. That God humbled himself. And he came on a rescue mission to seek and to save those who have sinned and are separated from God. Guys, this is who Jesus is. God become man from heaven. And if you think back to the narrative around the first Christmas in Matthew chapter 1, if you look back, if you still have your Bible open there, in verses 18 and 20, it speaks about Jesus being born by the Holy Spirit. All right, this is, this is the fulfillment of prophecy, that this is not just a man becoming God, this is God becoming a man born by the Holy Spirit. That at the first Christmas, God intervened in a miraculous way and he did something that had never been done before, will never happen again, and God came into human history by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to be born of a virgin woman. And again, let's just step off to the side. You come here and you're maybe more skeptical. That's fair. All right, this is a mysterious thing. This is a miraculous thing that we might not ever, actually we will never be able to fully comprehend this. But hear me on this. It doesn't negate it as true. Because if you just ex- it, like, think about like, our experience in our world today and just our daily life, guys, there are a plethora of things that we can't fully understand, we can't fully explain, but we accept it as true nonetheless. And maybe you would sit here and think about this and just think about, okay, God become a man. Man, that's interesting. I'll have to, I'll have to think about that. This is not just like an academic statement. Guys, this is really good news. Right? I mean, this is some of the greatest news that we can have. See, the fact that God became a man, that means that Jesus is personal and he's relevant to us all. That God is not some far off being that we can't really know. But he's come to us, he's near to us, he listens to us, he helps us because he's ultimately for us. And I know that some of you, you walked in here today and you don't feel like that. You feel like God is just really distant. That he's just kind of, if he does exist at all, he's very distant. He kind of looks at you like an angry dad who just is like, you're pathetic and I'm going to, you know, that's how you view God. He's not approachable. I need you to understand, this is not who our God is. That Jesus, he came down from heaven to be near to you. And so someone in here needs to hear this today. If you feel like God is very far and very distant from you, I need to know you know the truth, that God's presence in your life is a constant reality. Even if you don't feel it in the moment. And this is, goes back to verse 23 in Matthew chapter 1. With Jesus being Emmanuel, meaning God with us, guys, he's near you. He wants you. He wants to tell you about Jesus. He wants to shower you with love and grace. And he's here to meet with you today. And so number one, Jesus said that he came down from heaven. Number two, check this out. Jesus said that he is God. Mark chapter 14. But he remained silent, this is Jesus, and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ? And so these religious leaders who hate Jesus, they're trying to trap Jesus, ultimately kill Jesus, they come and say, are you the the chosen one? Are you the anointed one? Are Are you the special one? The son of the blessed. All right, they're saying, are you the son of God? All right, those who are wanting to kill Jesus, they just ask him openly, are you God? Verse 62, and Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. Some of you in this room right now, you've, you've been lied to. All right, not just about Santa, but about Jesus, okay? All right, you've, you've been told that Jesus never said he was God. And this was, for, this was me for the first 24 years of my life. I had people tell me a lot of things about Jesus and things that Jesus supposedly said. And honestly, I remember thinking, okay, like everybody's got their hot take. Everybody's got their opinion. I'm, 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 whatever, I'm, I'm good. But here, Jesus explicitly says, I am God. 
He literally says, I am, in verse 62. And when you read through the rest of the Gospels, we see this in other places. Jesus continues to do this. In John chapter 10, for example, when Jesus is being attacked by religious leaders and accused by religious leaders at the time, asking them, and Jesus looks at him, he's like, why do you hate me? Like, why are you trying to kill me? And in John 10, 33, they said, hey, you want to know why? It's because you make yourself out to be God. You're calling yourself God. That's why Jesus was killed. But some of you have been wrongly told that Jesus didn't consider himself God. That this whole thing that we're caught up in doing right now, that this was just a myth or a legend that was made up by the followers of Jesus after he died. Right? That they didn't want the story and the, the plot to end, and so they came up with the idea, hey, let's just tell people that Jesus actually said he was God so that we can kind of make up this big thing. And some of you have been told that. I need you to understand, guys, this is not true. It's not true. Throughout history, and even today, guys, many people will think that Jesus is simply like a miracle worker or a teacher or a servant or someone who really loves poor people. And Jesus is, in fact, all those things, but he's much more, guys. He's not just a good man, but he's the God man. And he's not just the best among sinners, but he's the savior of sinners. This is who Jesus is. And guys, the only reason that there's any amount of good news for us The only reason that celebrating Christmas makes any amount of sense is because Jesus is not just a good man. All right, the truth is there have been a lot of good men throughout the history of the world who have lived and died and been killed. And honestly, those men, they don't do anything for our lives. They don't do anything for our lives. But because Jesus is not just good, but he's also God, this means that there's good news for us. Because God made a way for us to be with him. And Jesus, he repeatedly and emphatically, and unapologetically, and publicly declared himself to be God. And this is so wildly different from every other world religion. That if you study the the major world religions throughout the world, no major world religion founder ever says and makes this claim that they are God. Buddha never said that he was God. Confucius never said that he was God. Krishna never said that he was God. Muhammad never said that he was God. No other major religious founder has ever made this claim. Jesus stands absolutely alone. And I wonder, Doxa, I wonder if you realize how great it is that Jesus is God. I wonder if you think about that. I know there's some of us here That we don't like the idea of there being a God because that means I'm under him and I have to answer to him. Because here's where I'm at. I I don't know if this is, I'm, I'm just grateful for God. And I'm grateful because he is creator over everything and king over all. And for me, the reason I'm so grateful is because when my life so oftentimes feels out of control, I know that there's someone who's actually in control. And that one who is in control is absolutely perfect, is absolutely powerful, is absolutely loving, and is absolutely with me. And that produces some joy in me. Christian, do you feel that? This is the Christmas reminder. This is what it's all about. Christmas helps us to remember that Jesus is the only God. And I want you to hear this. By the grace of God, he can be your God. Number three. Jesus said, take a look at this. Jesus said his miracles were signs. He says that his works validate his words. John chapter 10, here's what Jesus says. But God has set me apart for himself. He sent me into the world. Then how can you say that I am speaking against God because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, even you do not believe me. Believe the works that I do. Then you will know the Father is in me and I am in him. They tried again to take him, but he got out of their hands. Guys, Jesus did, in fact, feed the hungry. All right, the historical Jesus did, in fact, heal the sick. In his presence, the blind could see, the lame could leap for joy, the mute could sing out the praises of God. Jesus was, in fact, and is, in fact, a miracle worker. And when people would come to Jesus, enthralled by him, asking questions, who is this man? He continually and repeatedly and unapologetically said, I am God. In fact, if you look back, this is what he says right here. He says, I am God. I'm the Son of God. I and the Father are one. And as he did this, 
These people accused him of blasphemy, claiming himself to be God. And here, as Jesus is declaring himself to be God, he says to these people, hey, if you don't believe my words, believe my works. You might not believe the things that I say, but look at what I do, and that's going to prove the things that I say. That Jesus says, look at the plan and the power of God. Jesus says, look at the miraculous and the saving and the healing, transforming, life-changing power that comes from me. And he says, even if you hear my words and my claims about being God and about your sin, and you don't believe it, you have to see something in my works and believe it's true. And the greatest miracle is, is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, which is not just God flexing and showing off, but it's Jesus beating death and raising from death, presenting himself and validating and vindicating all of his claims to be God. He says, if you don't believe my words, believe my works. And guys, I want you to know that I really do believe that Jesus still works miracles today. He absolutely does. I've seen him heal people who are sick. I've seen him change lives that are destroyed. I've seen him save marriages that had no hope. I've seen addicts just liberated from substances. I've seen so many different miracles, even in the life of this church. Anyone need a miracle of God today? Jesus can do it. He can absolutely do it. And guys, as I say that, I want you to know, all right, this is me on the stage telling you, I need this in my life right now. I, I got a haircut, I got the vest, I got this, I can look all put together. I need you to know that the guy sitting on the, standing on the stage in front of you right now is broken. And I got stuff in my life that's causing a little stress, there's a little brokenness, there's a little anxiety, there's a little sadness, there's a, there's a whole lot of things going on. I'm not laying down. I'm not giving up. Because God is able. I've seen him do it in the past, and I'm trusting that he can do it again. Amen? This is our God. Christmas points to this reality. And so, guys, if you struggle to believe the words of Jesus, take a look at the works of Jesus. And look into the past and look at the historical Jesus and look at the past with his resurrection and let that speak to who he is. And even now, I want you to know that in this room, there are miracles of Jesus scattered all over this place. There are people in here, I knew who you were and you are a different woman right now. There are guys in here that used to just be pathetic womenizing addicts that I would not even let in my house. And now they're sitting in this church praising God. It's the power of Jesus. And we believe that Jesus is going to do miracles today. Some of you are going to become Christians today and God is going to save you from your sin. Some of you are going to leave here today changed. Some of you are going to leave here today liberated from insecurities and sin that hold you down. That God is totally able and he's going to redeem some of you. He does miracles and this is good news. Number four, take a look at this. Jesus actually said he is sinless. All right, He says this in John chapter 8. Take a look. Jesus says, which one of you convicts me of sin? I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Now, guys, this is an absolutely amazing claim. All right, that Jesus gets up in front of a group of people, a crowd that just absolutely wants him dead, and he says, does anybody here, do any of you have anything against me? Like, why do you want me to, like, do you have something against me? What have I done? And no one, no one can find anything wrong with Jesus they can't. They're like, this guy's done nothing wrong. And for us, you know, we tend to elevate and respect and honor the most holy and the most godly and the most honorable among us. But the reality is, guys, none of us are without sin. None of us are without sin. All right, that if you go home and you Google sinless, you're not going to find any people. All right, you're going to find some dessert recipes and a trashy gentleman's club in Vegas. Okay? That's all you're going to find. No people. Absolutely no people. None of us are perfect and none of us are sinless, only Jesus. And none of us can say that we are without sin. Only Jesus can make this claim. 
In fact, if you're here, guys, and you're not particularly religious, the times where you mess up and you drop the ball and you screw up, you have likely said over and over, well, nobody is what? Perfect, except Jesus. This is what he says. And because he is without sin, that means he can actually forgive your sin. And this leads to number five. Take a look. Jesus said he forgives sin. That we all have sin, and Jesus alone forgives us. Mark chapter two, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And then the critics around said, he's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So, in this moment, Jesus looks at a sinful man, just that Jesus would look at all of us today, and he says, your sins are forgiven. And those that were around in this moment, they're looking at what's going down, and they're like, hey, hold up. This is not right, because only God can do that. Only God can forgive sin. And so they accuse Jesus of blasphemy. And this is so important for us to know, guys, when we sin, we're actually sinning against God. This is the truth of Psalm 51. Against you, God, only do I sin. And so when we sin, we sin against God, and so it's God that needs to forgive our sin. And Jesus says, I forgive sin. And here's the thing. Because you know what each one of us needs above everything. We're thinking about all the things that we want to get this Christmas. You know what we need above everything. And and to understand this, We need to come to the realization that every single person in this world needs to be rescued and saved. I mean, do you think about your life like this? Do you think about your experience in the world like this? That every single person that you lock eyes with, including the one in the mirror, every single day, do you understand that every single one of us, we need to be rescued and saved? This is what Christmas is all about. This is absolutely true. That every single one of us, we're kind of in a position where we might not be aware of it or not, but there is a sentence of death hanging over us. And we can't save ourselves. And we need someone to come in and do what we can't do, which is to rescue us. And this is the backdrop of the birth of Jesus. And this is the backdrop of of the first Christmas. And this is the backdrop of the entire Bible and Christianity. And so if you're wondering why Jesus is such a big deal or you forget what Christmas is really about, this is the reason for Jesus coming. If you still have your Bible open, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says that we're all sinners in need of a Savior. And so no matter how polished up you are and how good everybody thinks you are, the most godly among us, the most moral among us, the most generous among us, we are all broken and messed up with sin. And we desperately need a Savior because the sin in our life brings about death. This is what the Bible teaches. It's spiritual death because our sin just separates us from God who is the source of life. And so apart from Him, while we can be physically alive, we're spiritually dead. Are you there? You're kind of like alive in the seat, but you're not connected to Jesus and there's just like a a death. And if if this continues on, guys, we we not only will get to the place where all of us will die physically, but if we are separated from God because we haven't come to Jesus, we're also going to die spiritually, which is just the terrible reality of hell. It's just eternal death. It's, It's eternal separation from God. And Christmas is the one time of year where the entire world just kind of stops. It's the one time a year where the entire world is confronted with this truth. That through all of our Christmas celebrations, God is trying to help us understand that the birth of Jesus Christ is the gift that we all need in the only way to be saved from sin, death, and hell. That we cannot save ourselves. That we all need forgiveness. And I love this about Jesus. I absolutely love this about Jesus. For the longest part of my life, I had people say, well, here, if you want to get close to God, here's what you need to do. Rob, you need to stop cussing. You need to stop drinking so much. Definitely stop chewing and smoking. Like, you can't do all that. You got to, here's a bunch of things that you need to do, and then maybe you'll get right with God. Anybody grow up like that? 
Anybody feel that pressure? Where you're never good enough for God. And every other religion in the world will say, here's what you can do with your sin. You can start giving. You can start going on holy pilgrimages. You can start doing a bunch of things so you can eventually get good enough where maybe God will work, out, work it out for you and you can get good enough for him. Jesus just says, no, 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 no. I'll take care of it for you. Finished. There is joy, Christian. Do you feel that? There is a light burden. There is an easy yoke because of this. We can rest and have peace that Jesus is mine and I'm his. Merry Christmas. This is our Jesus. And so Christian, today, this Christmas, remember this. Be grateful for this because the truth is gratitude yields worship. And so if you're a Christian, let me just encourage you with this. Tomorrow as you wake up, before your, your feet hit the floor, before your hand reaches for your phone, remember all that you have in Jesus. Maybe, instead of reaching for the phone, you reach for your Bible and you just read Ephesians chapter 1 and be reminded of all the blessings that you have in Jesus, that you have been adopted, you have been sealed, you have been forgiven, you have been made clean. And let that stir some worship in you. And as you're reminded of the gift of Jesus and his salvation, like before you even get up, you can just say, oh my gosh, I'm going to heaven. Like if I just had that perspective every day, like would that be a little bit of joy to push me through a crappy day? Right? I could get through anything if I actually believed it. If I was actually grateful for this and it led me to worship, it changes everything. Christian, do that. And for those of you who are not a Christian, I want you to know that this is the offer for you today. All right, that forgiveness of sin is not yours right now. I'm not going to lie to you. It comes only through Jesus, but it can be. That in love, I, I believe that God in his sovereignty has, has brought you here because he loves you and he wants to open your eyes so you can see Jesus. He wants you to get past all the religion and all the church background and baggage that you might be walking in here with. And he says, let me just strip all that away and let me just help you to see Jesus because this will change everything. And you can come to Jesus today and he will love you, he will serve you, and he will save you because he is good. And then lastly, number six, Jesus says he is the only way to heaven. John 14, six, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So not only does Jesus come down from heaven and live without sin and die for our sin, but he rises from death and then he ascends back into heaven. And as he does this, he opens the doorway into the presence of God. And he invites us to pass through that door by trusting in him. And there's something so important that we need to see in this, okay? Jesus is the only way. He's the only way. And I need to tell you this because I don't want to be dishonest with you. I got to tell the truth, but not all religions save. Not all paths lead to eternal life. Not all gods and goddesses are the one true God. Jesus is absolutely exclusive. And I know for some of you in here, that this is something that in our world, especially in a city like Madison, this is absolutely controversial. Even Christians will hear me say this and think, oh man, you probably shouldn't say that. That's going to ruffle some feathers that's going to turn some people away, that's going to make some people mad. But here's where I'm at as I share this, guys. I can't be a liar. i got to be a truth teller. My job is to simply just to open up the Bible and tell you the truth. Your job is to figure out what to do with it. That if this is, in fact, the Word of God, validated and vindicated by the resurrection of Jesus, our position is here. It's under it. And we don't go through it like the great Thomas Jefferson and kind of go through it with an exacto knife and cut out the bad sections that we don't like because it doesn't fit our life agenda. But we have to say, this is actually the word of God and what he says, it's, it's greater than what I think. And we just need to know that what Jesus is saying here is emphatically true. That there is no salvation there's no forgiveness of sin. There's no eternal life with God. There's no reconciliation with God without faith in Jesus. And here's the great part about this. See, guys, 
I love this. Again, I love Jesus so much, but I love this. Not only is Jesus exclusive, but he's inclusive. And this is a word that we love in our time and age, right? But he's inclusive, meaning he invites us all. That no matter what sin you have committed, Jesus invites you. No matter what background you're from, Jesus invites you. No matter what religion you have participated in in the past, Jesus invites you. No matter if you've been agnostic or atheist or, or just apathetic, Jesus invites you. That the door is open. That he's exclusive, meaning there's only one door, but it's inclusive and that everybody is welcome to walk through that one door through faith. And so you are welcome today. No matter what, Jesus welcomes you to himself. And this is what God wants you to know this Christmas. And we want you here at Doxa to feel welcome because this is what Jesus did. We want everyone to feel love because this is what Jesus did. We want everyone to know the truth and wrestle with the truth because this is what Jesus did. And so let me just end with this. Because all these things that we just looked at, all these things that Jesus just said, they're either true or false, okay? I mean, these are the only two options for us. I wanna share with you this, this quote from a man named C.S. Lewis, a brilliant author, theologian. He says this, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said, so all these things that we've been listening to today, wouldn't be a great moral teacher He'd either be insane or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else insane or something worse. But let's not come up with any patronizing nonsense about this, his being a great human teacher. He hasn't left that open to us. He didn't intend to. Because when it comes to Jesus and all the truth that he just said to us today about his life, It's either true and it's absolutely good that we're gathered here today like we are right now, or it's false and what we're doing here is just wildly weird. Wildly weird. I mean, think about it. This is a dude that claims to be God. This is a guy who tells us to pray to him, to confess sin to him, to worship to him, to give our lives over to him. If he is not God, then he is the most despicable, terrible, lying, damnable man who has ever lived. But if he tells the truth, he is in fact God. No other option. Docs, Christmas reminds us that life is all centered on Jesus. That the whole point of human history is Jesus. That all of scripture, it's about Jesus. And at this point, in human history at the first Christmas, in Matthew chapter one, God steps into human history as the man Jesus Christ and the spotlight of heaven guided by a star shines on him to show the whole world, here's the Savior. He didn't want anybody to miss him. This is Christmas. It's God coming to save you. And Doc, so when I met Jesus, I was 23 years old. And I can tell you personally and practically that Jesus didn't just make a difference in world history, but he made a very profound difference in my personal history. That my entire life, you, don't, you, you never knew me before, but my entire life has been completely transformed and redeemed by the person and work of Jesus. And Christmas is an invitation for you to have that story too. But also to remind us that God who came for us is still with us today. So back to those three types of people that are in this room right now. Those of you who are disciples, you're excited, you're like, get off the stage, I wanna sing, right? Just be quiet, Rob, right? I get it, okay? Let me just tell you this, remember and rejoice. Remember and rejoice. Never forget the gospel. Never forget the words of Jesus. Pray that the Holy Spirit of God would help Hebrews chapter 12 actually be true in your life, that you would lock your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. So every single day, not just the days that you're here, but every single day you can rejoice exceedingly with great joy. Lock your eyes on Jesus. For those of you who are more in the familiar camp and you're kind of numb, all right, we got these things 
that we, I think by code we have to in the kitchen. I walked past them this morning, those, uh, those shock paddles, like defibrillator. If you need that, like we can shock you before you leave, right, and just wake you up a little bit. No, but here, here's the thing. You need something to kind of snap you out of, of the funk in the numbness. And maybe this is you, not just playing church, not just kind of doing the things and going through the motions, but maybe this is you deciding like, hey, I'm actually, you know what? I need to figure this out. I need to open up my Bible. I need to open up the history books, and I actually need to go to work with this. And I actually need to think, like, what did Jesus say? What did he do? What did he give me? And allow that. Maybe you just sit in your seat and just pray and say, God, would you just remove the callus from my heart and just let me feel? Would you remove the cataracts from my eyes and just let me see the goodness and the greatness of Jesus and just ask him to just light a fire in you? I feel like that's a prayer God would love to answer. And for those of you who are just kind of dismissive and just apathetic, guys, I need you to understand how much God loves you. You are part of a massive eternal plan that has landed you here today. My understanding of the world and of sin is that when Jesus says no one comes to the Father except through me, there is no reason that any of us would be in this room if it wasn't God the Father pursuing you and drawing you to himself right now. You would not be here. Like you wouldn't. Your sin, it would keep you out of here. But God is at work in your life to bring you to this place to encounter Jesus. And maybe you just need to stop hardening your heart today. Or maybe moving forward, you just need to lay down your pride and say, okay, let me just actually do the work of exploring and examining the man Jesus. He loves you. He's come for you. Guys, Christmas means joy. Christmas means miracle. Christmas means that God has come for us. The king of heaven exchanged his throne for a cradle. The almighty swaddled himself with vulnerability. The creator entered into his own creation. The author put himself on the page. The infinite became an infant. The giver became the gift. Jesus arrived as Emmanuel, God with us. Merry Christmas, Doxa Church. This is what it's all about. It's Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. Father, thank you for your love that didn't just exist like as an ethereal thing, but your love that is actionable, that you loved and it made you send your one and only son to die for us. And so Holy Spirit, you say that you're a helper and a guide. Would you be that for us today? For those who are disciples, would you just help us to recall the work that you have done in our lives? Would you help us to recall the gospel of Jesus? Would you help us to recall the first time we heard the gospel and how sweet it sounded? Would you help us to recall all that Jesus has done? Would you help us to recall your promises as we move forward? And would you stir within us worship that would produce abounding joy in our lives as we leave this place? God, for those who are just kind of familiar and numb. Would you break in and allow them not just to hear some things and understand some things, but to experience those things. And for those, God, who have just been dismissive of you and just apathetic of Jesus, I pray that just as you came for me, and it was just that moment of just you opening my eyes and I saw you, that you would cause that to happen. That they would sense your presence, they would lay down their pride and their sin in Jesus, that you would save their life. Would you just do it? So Jesus, you are worthy, we love you, and we pray all these things in your name. Amen.